So my name's um, Harry Barton. I'm from Nottingham Business School. Um, I stand here in a, in a strange place, really, because the first third of my life I spent as an operational police officer, and then I moved to the Audit Commission, and then I moved to academia. So my mind is a little bit buzzing sometimes when I, I do uh, police research. But I look at it from uh, an interesting perspective insofar as I can try to operationalise the practical realities of policing in the past and hopefully for the future. Um, in terms of trust, I think it's um, well known that UK policing in the round has always been uh, subject to certain incidents over the last 50 or 60 years which have led to a, um, a breakdown in trust, certainly within certain communities in certain parts of, uh, parts of the country. Now, I joined the police in London in the very early 1980s. And it was the end of the uh, Robert Mark era, and uh, many of you be aware of the, um, the allegations and very well-founded allegations of corruption within certain areas of the Metropolitan Police, and the clear-up that occurred and all the rest of it, and a change of attitude, really, of uh, new chief constables or commissioners who came into the Metropolitan Police. Um, this was driven, effectively, um, to a new um, type of uh, recruitment policy in some respects, where paying conditions of the police were changed following the uh, Emin Davis review, and police officers of the police service received quite a um, significant injection in terms of additional resources and funding. And when I joined, Sir so Kenneth Newman was the the Commissioner, and uh, we all received the little blue book, The Principles of Policing, which basically was um, a little guide, um, effectively saying how you should behave as police officers, going back to uh, the traditional roots of um, policing. I had a quick look on Google yesterday, and it's actually sold two copies in the last 40 years. So it is a reflection, possibly, that it may quite have missed the point a little bit. But nevertheless, it's still there. Uh, you bone both. Yeah. <laughs> and um, during that time, it was very interesting as an operational police officer that I was uh, involved in uh, many of the more um, notorious type of incidents which occurred. And uh, Broadwater farm riots, Brixton, Wapping, the miners' strike, all of these elements often... Um, found myself in the situation where uh, you wondered whether the general population trusted what you were doing. My intentions were legitimate, my colleagues' intentions were honest, we were directed to perform certain activities and hopefully we reduced uh, violence within public order situations to levels where eventually we were able to, um, to disperse. But quite clearly, commissioners, chief constables, the Home Office have always had this notion that policing or police officers need to change to reflect the times. And so, as is always the case, new commissioners come in and new commissioners have new ideas. Uh, Sir Peter Rimbert came in and he had an idea of um, the PLUS programme, the, na the notion that you know, police officers should be involved with the community more. Um, and this was generally very well accepted, certainly within the Metropolitan uh, Police, and um, I think improvements occurred. The very end of my uh, service in the Met, I was part of the service restructuring team, which actually looked at lots of aspects of how operational policing could evolve to reflect and be more positive in response to the demands of the general population, which was an interesting um, project in itself. Quite clearly, a lot of this um, reflects um, the observations of the Assistant Chief Constable earlier on, that up until the present day, there are ongoing incidents that should have occurred. There are attempts by both the Home Office, the police service, to actually move the police into a new era by which they hope that their legitimacy, trust and confidence in the police will improve through, in the main, greater transparency, greater openness and a greater awareness, hopefully, in the general population that they're trying to work towards uh, their aspirations to have a well-meaning, honest police service, which I think in the main we still do have. 
My only research interests are in operational policing. I believe very strongly in the notion of um, lean policing, efficiency and effectiveness, which some of you may moan and groan about, but there are certain else aspects and elements of the type of work that I did in the Commission which were actually useful and perhaps have been um, slandered to an extent, but nevertheless there are some elements of it which can be picked up, hopefully, to, um, to progress and move to a police service which is more about continued improvement, not only in the service itself, but in individuals, in their perceptions of what they actually can do within the police service itself. This actual paper that I'm going to have a look at now is a comparative study, and it looks at trust, and it looks at trust across a catalogue of countries. And this is a result of um, research that has been conducted using data from uh, the European Social Service Survey, which is a um, five-yearly review, and I think the, the next review is coming out very shortly, which actually looks at the perceptions of populations in different countries towards trust in their police service. And this paper is actually published in the International Journal of Emergency Services Management. If anybody's interested in looking at it, it's out there in the public domain. And it just sort of is an attempt to try to draw some conclusions and discussions about the nature of trust, but making the observation that within different countries, the perception of trust in their police service is very different. And why is that important? Well, it's important because we live in a multiracial society with every country around the world living within the population, be it in Birmingham, be it in London. And I think that the more comparative understanding we have of the experiences of individuals from different countries towards the police may enable us to understand some of the resentment and some of the difficulties that we may have in actually managing to discuss and engage with those populations within our communities. So, the degree of public trust in a country's police service will impact on the level of resources required for the maintenance of public order and the ability to prevent crime and detect offenders. So, the argument would go, if the general population trusts and has confidence in the police, there is likelihood that the amount of resources having to spend preventing those having a negative impact on the environment will be reduced. Recent public order instruments put into spotlight that the police and the role they play in society's maintenance of peace enforces the law. So, if I've used Turkey just as an example, but there are other instances where you see on the media the actions of the police or the reports of some of the incidents that the police have done in those countries has a negative impact on the trust that the population has. Policing organisations have similar mandates but operate in different ways with different internal organisational structures. So we have the police across the world. You'll see the name police, policey, policey, whatever. So police are everywhere but they operate in different ways and the perception of how they operate within their own countries is very, very different. So the degree to which the public trusts police clearly varies across countries, although the reasons for this are not straightforward, which is quite obvious. So, we've used the European Social Survey. My colleague, Professor Malcolm Bain at Cardiff Business School, is a professor of uncertain reasoning. And he is a very clever chap. And we've used what is described as a fuzzy set theory to analyse a number of different items to look and measure the trust in different countries engaged within this survey. <clears throat> so the five factors identified are compliance, so the higher the value, the more compliant the public. Security, the higher the value, the more secure the public express themselves. Cooperation, the higher the value, the more uh, cooperative to the public. Effectiveness, the higher the value, the more perceived effectiveness of the police. And fairness, the higher the value, the more perceived fairness of the police. All of these numbers, all of these results are put into a whopping big algorithm and out pops lots of nice little pictures and figures. So for anybody who is a mathematical genius who wishes to look at this paper, go and speak to Malcolm, because he's the brains behind this. But nevertheless, after all of the analysis, 
some very, very pretty pictures, some very, very pretty um, algorithms, we come up with this. So, in terms of, and it may not be a surprise, or it may be a surprise, we see that those countries with high trust are categorised under two different um, areas. Low security, high effectiveness and high fairness. This applies to countries such as Estonia and Spain. Now, Estonia is an interesting case in point because when the new uh, elected government was put into power, they dismissed the police service and reintroduced a new police service totally. So it would be interesting to have seen what the results of this survey were pre the Estonian Revolution and post. And the same thing is actually happening in the Ukraine. Despite all the political turbulence in the Ukraine, the Ukrainian government has actually uh, dismissed swathes of Ukrainian police officers and has recruited a cadre of 3,000 elite police officers to try to instill a greater level of confidence and trust in these individuals within that country. So just very briefly moving down, we still maintain a level of trust in the UK, as was Germany, Denmark, Finland, the Netherlands, Norway and Sweden. <coughs> Interestingly, and this is what people uh, perhaps draw upon, France is actually in the low trust regime, um, purely from this analysis, um, along with other countries which possibly we may um, anticipate would record quite low scores. Those are the figures as they've come out of the survey. Those are the figures that are validated against the mathematical algorithms. Um, I think it's a very important um, thing to note that these require, obviously, um, an attention of detail, um, a level of real examination to try to understand what's happening behind the numbers. So the conclusion is, the importance and impact that police have on countries' internal and external reputation. The power of social media, I think, is incredibly important in increasingly highlighting good and bad police practices and impacting on the reputation of the police. I think that's pretty common sense. Confidence and trust in police is increasingly strained through, I would argue, poor leadership in many cases and perceived as over-aggressive tactics. Need for police to recognise the mechanics of public order maintenance and extend social integration and community orientated approach to policing to maintain the support of the public. There's no easy answers to difficulties police face in the future, but growing understanding that more psychological understanding in nature of mixed social demographic communities. And finally, in technical terms, the complex and parsimony solutions are the two endpoints of a single complex parsimony continuum. Future research in this area should consider possible intermediate solutions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've got just got a, uh, a, a question about the survey instrument uh, uh, itself. I guess this is a, an issue about uh, uncertain reasoning and or, or, or maybe uh, uncertainty about reasoning. Um, com completing uh, surveys, public surveys, requires a certain uh, certain socio-technical proficiencies, which mean that some people are good with surveys and other people aren't. So uh, how much can we, uh, how far can we actually go with public surveys and related big data uh, in eliciting knowledge about confidence, legitimacy and trust? Like how good are surveys as a research instrument for dealing with these uh, types of problems? I think with the um, doing comparative research, the robustness of an instrument that can do something pan-European or global is based on its legitimacy over a period of time. Now, this is the fifth round of the European Social Survey, and every survey leads to greater refinements. Now, I've utilised the survey as a data set and applied novel mathematics to it, which is a, is a unique approach. And it, but it provides some form of measure um, from which to base some form of um, discussion and analysis. I wouldn't say it was uh, ideal, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's moving in that general direction. J just going back to what the gentleman from De Montford said, and I'll touch a little bit of this um, on, um, when I talk 
after lunch, if anyone's still here after lunch, but I'm sure they will be, Kevin. Um, the I, I think when we, no matter how good a survey is, and and we do learn every time we do, and I think there was some significant learning from um, the 2013, 14 when when I did a test within West Midlands. But one of the issues I think we'll constantly face, even if it's a qualitative approach, is y y you ask 10 different people or you uh, a, a question with the word confidence in there and the words local police. They will have different experiences and ideas of what confidence means to them and what local police means to them. And I think no matter how, whatever approach you take, that, that will always be a shortcoming within the measure that we put in place for measuring confidence. Um, and I mean, I, I certainly think, in terms of what Kevin talked about, having multi sort of faceted ways of doing it is is the right way. But still, we go back to that original point, which is, in my view, um, that massive um, difference for different people based on their experiences, on their neighbourhoods, their contact or not with the police, of what confidence actually means to them. I think there's also a thing about if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. You know, there is a case of, you know, you got to start somewhere. And I think that within these difficult constructs of trust, confidence, legitimacy, you know, to try to uh, understand it, we need to certainly draw upon the collective um, views or opinions of as broad a community as possible. And from there, from whatever data we elicit, we want to try to develop as robust um, a methodology to analyse it that will give value and benefit to, to us, the, you know, the utilisers of that data. Um, does the, the issue of um, budgets, uh, police pay and perceptions of uh, declining uh, professionalism, do they affect legitimacy? I think that um, the pay and benefits and the pay and rations question is a very important one. I can see that the nature of policing is going to fundamentally change through the impacts of cybercrime on the nature of criminal activity. And we've already seen it in terms of organised crime. To combat that, you're going to need a level of sophistication, which hitherto has not necessarily been um, part of the armoury of the police. Now, you either recruit and retain those people with certain prerequisite skills to train up to, to counter those threats, or you recruit individuals who have the, um, the capabilities and competencies to actually mature and develop within that sphere to combat that type of threat. We're living in a highly competitive marketplace. Why would an individual wish to join the police service? All not with the standing that they want to do the best for the public good and all the rest of it. Unless you um, make the system attractive enough, and part of that attractiveness is the rewards that those individuals do, not only through uh, job enrichment, but also how much they're getting paid. And there is a danger that un in the future, the legitimacy of the, uh, the war against such as organised crime in cyberspace can be undermined by not being able to recruit the appropriate people to actually undertake those tasks. 